and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be applying concentration inequalities. Part 1. So what are concentration inequalities? To remind you from last time, and the ones we'll be using today, are McDermott's inequality, which said if a random variable x is C Lipschitz, then it's concentrated around its expectation in the sense that the probability of x minus e of x absolute value there being greater than lambda, so being at least lambda distance away from the expectation, is at most 2 e to the minus lambda squared over t 2 c squared n, where n is the number of trials, uh, independent trials, that x depends on. So that was McDermott's inequality, which we derived from the more general Azuma's inequality. So if let 0 equal x0 up to xm be a martingale, so you start at 0 and you move in martingale fashion, such that for every i and m, xi minus xi minus 1 is in most 1, so if you can only move uh, 1 in any given step, then for every lambda greater than 0, the probability that xm is greater than lambda square root of m, so you've moved square root of m kind of distance away, is at most e to the minus lambda squared over 2. And that would scale, because you could scale the variables if you want them to change by c, and then be c Lipschitz. And you can renormalize, so the expectation is zero to apply this, and, and then derive McDermid's from Azumas. So we did that before and, and proved these inequalities, but now I'd like to apply them. So today's examples, today we'll use concentration inequalities. Our big example of today will be showing that the chromatic number of the erdos rheny random graph GNP, so chi of GNP, is tightly concentrated around its expectation. So we won't derive what the expectation is, that would be a bit more involved, uh, but instead we will focus on just showing that whatever that expectation is, it's concentrated around it. And how will we do this? Well, we'll do two parts. We'll first do an easier argument that shows it's concentrated within O of root n log n, which is pretty good as the expectation is actually much larger than that. And so this would give us good concentration, but then we'll actually do even better, which will be amazing, uh, to show that it's within at most three. So there's at most four values that it's actually concentrated on, at least for large p. So that's the plan. Let's get on with it. So let's define what I call graph Lipschitz. So a graph theoretic function f is c edge Lipschitz. If whenever h and h prime as graphs differ in only one edge, then this function f, the difference, the absolute value of the difference there of fh and fh prime is at most c. So if you change, if you add or subtract one edge, it only changes the function by at most c. That's c edge Lipschitz. And similarly, we say it's c vertex Lipschitz if whenever h and h prime differ in only one vertex, uh, then f of h minus f of h prime is at most c. And you could debate what the meaning of that if you're deleting or adding a vertex or just changing the edges around vertex. Uh, either way, it'd only be a factor of two or so. So those are nice notions, uh, C edge Lipschitz and C vertex Lipschitz. An easy proposition is that when F is C edge Lipschitz or C vertex Lipschitz, then the corresponding edge exposure martingale or vertex exposure martingale respectively is also C Lipschitz. So it's a little uh, bit of arithmetic there to compute with conditional probabilities, uh, but it does follow. So intrinsically then uh, we could apply uh, Azumas then to those, or if you'd rather, you can think of it as actually applying uh, McDermid's instead. So now we'll discuss how to do that for the chromatic number. Since changing an edge changes the chromatic number by at most one, chi is one edge Lipschitz. And then what can we derive from that? Well, if you apply then McDermid's with c equal one to this function, so you don't even need Azumas then, uh, you'd have the probability that chi is far from its expectation is at most 2e to the minus lambda squared over 2, uh, but you'd get n shoes to, as there'd be n shoes to uh, events, the events being the edges. And is that good? Well, this is useless, actually, since the number of trials is then much larger than the expectation. So this won't really give you any kind of concentration when lambdas say at most n, and obviously the chromatic number is at most n, so this doesn't really tell you anything. So what do we do instead? We instead use the fact that chi is also one vertex Lipschitz, and so we instead use Azumas and the vertex exposure martingale. So that's why the vertex exposure one's a bit nice. We kind of do more exposing at a time, so we have fewer steps 
and then we can apply Azumas. Or if you'd rather, you could equivalently think of this as actually a McDermott's and not using Martin Gales at all, but the idea being that you'd group uh, the trials, so you, instead of n choose two trials, you group them into n sets of trials, it, in the same way you would do with uh, the vertex exposure martingale. So you would think, you know, there's the first vertex, the edges around it, then second, the remaining edges around it, third, etc. And so you kind of group them into these trials, and so you think of each trial as actually the combination, the product of those individual trials, but they'd still be independent and changing the outcomes around one vertex still only changes it by one. So either way we get that, we get this better concentration where the denominator, we get an N instead of an N choose two, because there's only N trials there. And then if we set them to be two root N log N, uh, then you put that in, you'd get uh, little o one over N. So almost always the chromatic number would be concentrated uh, within a root N log N. And now you can see that's actually a more general property, namely if you have a graph parameter and it's C vertex Lipschitz, where we view C as some constant, and the expectation is linear, then it's concentrated within the expectation on O of, of root n log n, almost always. Uh, so that's quite nice then. And now what else can we get from that? Well, it applies not only to the chromatic number, but to other graph parameters. So what graph parameters are one vertex Lipschitz? You might want to pause for a moment and think of some of your favorite parameters and are they vertex Lipschitz or edge Lipschitz, etc. Uh, I'll go ahead and just list you a few. So here are my answers. There are many interesting ones, including chromatic number, clique number, independence number, maximum matching size, vertex cover, Hadwiger number, and so on. So there's many interesting ones, and this uh, Lipschitz, this uh, Vertex exposure martingale tells us actually all of these are rather well concentrated around their expectation, no matter really what that expectation is. So that's nice, but now back to the question of can we do better? So here's the question, can we concentrate chi tighter if p is large? And you could do this with the other variables, the other parameters as well, but let's just do chromatic number for today. So this is a bit strange to expect, right? I mean, root n log n seems natural, right? Depending on what probability there you want, right? Root n for Bernoulli, you know, random variables of Chernoff bound style is somewhat the standard deviation. So it would be strange to expect you could do better. But the idea is that chromatic number is actually not really the sum of these random variables, right? It's its own unique mysterious function. And so it may be possible that actually chi is much tighter and we'll try to give some meaning to that. And so here's the theorem, let p equal n to the minus alpha, where alpha greater than 5, 6 is fixed, and let g be g n p. So this is saying the edge probability is a bit large, but still not necessarily quadratic, so where p is a constant, just at least n to the minus 5, 6. Then we claim that there exists a u equal u n p, so to depend on n and p, such that almost always chi of g is between u and u plus 3. So that is chi of g is concentrated in four values. And actually, if p is even larger, more like n minus 1 half, you can get this down to, to two values. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit with um, the uh, clique number being concentrated as such. Here, uh, we're doing it with the chromatic number. So how are we going to do this? How can we possibly show that it's within 3? Well, here's the key technical lemma we're going to use. Let alpha and c be fixed, where alpha is bigger than 5, 6, and let p be n minus alpha and g be g and p. Then we claim that almost always every c square root n vertices of g induce a three colorable subgraph. So if you look at the induced subgraph, if you look at the subgraph with the edges on just those vertices, we claim that it's actually three colorable. Which is a strange property to imagine being true that every decently small subgraph is actually through color. Every one, almost always. So as n goes to infinity, the probability that that isn't true, that every one of them is three colorable, goes to zero. But it is actually true, so let's, let's prove it. So how do we do this? This doesn't use concentration inequalities here, we're just gonna do some counting. So we must show that almost always, proof of the lemma, that there does not exist this t. t, of course, would have size at least four if it's not three colorable and at most c squared of n, such that g of t is not three colorable. So that might be a bit hard to get a grasp on. How do we do this? Well, you actually think it would suffice to show there is no minimal such set t. So pass to the minimal sets. 
So you could think the four critical or rather four vertex critical uh, subgraphs that are small. And then what do we know about such minimal sets is that minimal such T has minimum degree at least three because of the greedy algorithm. If there was a vertex of degree three, delete it, then the smaller thing must be not three colorable since you could extend a three color to larger, so that wouldn't be minimal. So minimal such T's, these critical ones, have degree at least three, and hence the number of edges in the induced subgraph is at least three T over two uh, by handshaking. And so now what do we know? So instead of saying forbidding these non three colorable small subgraphs, we'll be, forbid these somewhat dense uh, small subgraphs. So it suffices to show that almost always there does not exist this t, t between 4 and c squared of n, such that the number of edges in the induced subgraph of t is at least 3t over 2. And we can upper bound this probability pretty directly that there is such a t. So the probability that there exists such a t is the following. Let's sum over all t, so fix all the different t from 4 to c squared to n. Then what would you have to do for a specific set t of, of, of t vertices? Well, there are n choose t ways to choose those vertices, and then of the t choose two possible edges, we need at least three t over two of them, so you would choose those. And for each one, uh, you would actually need uh, p to the three t over two u. So you need the coin flip to go well for those edges. And this will indeed count all the possible ways. We don't count, need to count them more then because this will be subsumed uh, by, oh, they actually needed to have at least three t over two the first. So that's how we upper bound the probability. So we sum over all possible t's, you choose the t vertices, then you choose which three t over two edges you want, and then you uh, product by the probability for each edge. And now that might seem a bit arduous, a bit tedious to do, but we can upper bound this with our methods we had from before. So we upper bound n choose t by any, any over t to the t, and similarly t choose two, three, uh, choo choose three t over two, we do the same thing, so you'll note that that would be roughly t squared over 2 divided by 3t over 2, which gives you t over 3 uh, to the 3t over 2. So we use that. So each term is at most uh, that first thing, n e over t to the t, second term t e over 3, 3t over 2, and then we have this p to the 3t over 2, and remember p is n minus alpha. So we just put that in. Now we can factor out in the exponent a t on all of those terms. So we'd have an n e over t in the middle there, a t e over 3 to the 3 halves, and an n minus 3 alpha over 2. And now we can cancel a little bit. So the t to the 3 halves divided by t becomes a root t there, a t to the 1 half. We get an n 1 minus 3 alpha over 2. And then we have this weird constant e e to the 3 halves over 3 to the 3 halves. Well, I'm just going to write that as a c1. Uh, it's just some constants, most e. Uh, so we'll keep that. Then what do we do? We remember that t is uh, at, always at most c to the root n, so I could plug that in. I don't know what c is. Remember, c is just some fixed constant we're given, but I'm going to wrap that in with c1 to make a c2, and we get an n to the 1 quarter. And then I can rewrite that by smashing the n to the quarter and n to the 1 minus 3 alpha over 2 together uh, to get an n to the minus epsilon, where epsilon is 3 halves alpha minus 5 quarters. And importantly, since alpha was greater than our 5 sixths, that number epsilon is greater than zero. So this is some uh, actual, you know, root. It might not be linear, but it's some actual uh, root there. So we're getting a 1 over n to the epsilon. Raised to the power of t for each t from 4 up to root n. And now we're done, so that sum, thankfully, then, uh, would actually give you a geometric series. So you get o n to the minus 4 epsilon, with 4 being the worst one. Uh, times some constant that's negligible, namely it's like the most two, uh, and the constant we already have already. So we get that this is indeed um, O of uh, one using geometric series. So now we've completed the proof of the lemma. We showed that indeed uh, this probability, strangely that all the small ones are not three colorable, goes to zero. And now we can go ahead with the proof of our theorem. So how are we going to prove this theorem? We have this lemma. So that was just kind of a, a cute lemma uh, using kind of our, our basic probability techniques, union bounding bounds with the uh, choice, you know, the binomial coefficients. But now how do we use that? So we somehow we have to apply uh, Azuma's or Mark McDermott's and, and try to actually uh, get a con concentration to just four variables. And now, of course, you see three colorable. There's something to that plus three. How do we do this? So here's the magic. 
let epsilon greater than zero be arbitrarily small, and let u equal u a function of n and p and epsilon be the least integer such that the probability that chi is at most u is at least epsilon. So kind of we want to find this threshold, right, where it's between u and u plus three. So let's identify, I don't know what that is, but there is some least u where the, it's minimal and the probability is, though it is still at least epsilon. So there's kind of a chance that this is the expectation, but it may not be, right? It may be that it's wildly spread out. And so we don't, we don't really have a grasp, but we've identified this, this at least uh, the u where we at least know we're above an epsilon uh, probability. Now, here's what we do. Now we don't work with chi as our function. Uh, we work with something weirder. So we define a y as, as a random variable to be the minimum size of a set S, where S is a subset of the vertices of G, where chi of G minus S is at most U. So we ask, you know, U is this good target to get to. How many vertices do we need minima, minimal to delete to get down to a, a subgraph of chromatic number at most U? And so we will work with this variable. And since, here's the important part, since changing an edge can add or subtract at most one to y, so think about that, right? If I change an edge, right, it can in kind of, we know this minimum one, it can only enlarge uh, the, this set by one or not. Uh, there can't now magically be one that's much better than there was before and vice versa. So the vertex exposure martingale on y is one Lipschitz. So y is strangely a, a function that's one vertex Lipschitz. So by a zoom is inequality with m equal n, uh, we actually gonna need both tails. So the probability that y is much smaller than mu, mu being the expectation of y, minus lambda squared of n is at most e to the minus lambda squared over two. And similarly that it's much larger than the expectation that y is at least mu plus lambda squared n is also equally small. So here's the weird part. I'm gonna use these two uh, inequalities to convince you that y is actually small with high probability. So let's think through that. Let lambda satisfy e to the minus lambda squared over two equal to epsilon. Why do I do that? Then that those tail events would have probability strictly less than epsilon. So if I choose lambda appropriately, then actually we can determine that y isn't too, either too far below or too far above the expectation. But think about it. Chi of g is at most uh, u if and only if y is zero, right? If y is zero, I don't have to delete anything to get chi of g being u. But if chi of g was not u, I'd have to delete at least something. So that means that the probability that y equals zero is equal to the probability that chi of g is at most u, because they're the same event. And that's at least epsilon by definition, by construction of u. And now we're almost done, because then the first inequality implies that mu is at most lambda root n, right? Because well, y being zero is um, greater than epsilon, so there can't actually be a low tail smaller than epsilon because y equals zero is there, and so actually then mu has to be close to zero, namely it have to be at most lambda squared n. And then the second inequality tells you, well, in the other direction, y isn't too far. So probability that y would be at least a lambda root n, in particular then the probability that y would be at least two lambda root n, uh, would be most the probability that y is mu plus lambda root n, which would be most epsilon. So y can't be too much larger than root n, and hence the probability that y is at most two lambda root n is at least one minus epsilon. So what have we found out? We found out using Azumas that indeed this set of vertices delete to get down to a mu color, a u colorable subgraph is uh, very small with high probability. And then if we imply the lemma, if y was actually small, if it was actually most two lambda root n, then by the lemma, every small set almost always is three colorable. So the probability that chi would be at most three on the induced subgraph g y uh, would be at least one minus epsilon. So together, since by definition, chi of g minus y is at most u, then you would need u for the rest of the vertices and three for that small set y. So the probability that chi of g is at most u plus three is at least one minus two epsilon, because there's one minus epsilon chance uh, that y is small, and then one minus epsilon chance that that small one is three colorable. And so we're almost done. By the minimality of u on the other hand, so this tells us with high probability u chi is at most u plus three, what about the lower bound? Well, the probability that chi is at least u is one minus the probability that chi is at most u minus one. 
But since u is minimal, it can't be that the probability of chi being at most u minus 1 is at least lambda, because we picked u to be this threshold part. So indeed, that must be a most epsilon. And so then 1 minus that probability must be at least 1 minus epsilon. And hence, the probability that u is at most chi is at most u plus 3 is at least 1 minus 3 epsilon. So an epsilon for each one, but epsilon was arbitrarily small. And so u is at most chi is at most u plus 3 almost always. So almost always we indeed are concentrated around four values. So that was the proof of our main theorem of the today about the chromatic number. So if you just use Lipschitz, if you use the vertex exposure martingale, you can get a root n log n concentration for any p. Here we'd have a concentration when p is larger to actually just four values. And again, you could do more if p was even larger, try and concentrate it more. But the key idea was that small sets are almost always three colorable, all of them. And then how many do you need to delete around this threshold is, uh, is indeed also a martingale. So it'd be tightly concentrated, it'd be small. And so then picking this u to be the one that's somewhat around that threshold uh, shows that you're concentrated between u and u plus three. So a very nice application of concentration inequalities that's not just straightforward. So we passed to a different function uh, to apply Azumas. So that's all for today. Next time we'll continue with part two of applying concentration inequalities. Until next time, see you then!